And uh, this morning, we're going to have a special reading, pulling an audible on the sound, guys. John, if you come forward. It's my son, Jonathan, from D.C., and uh, he's also, <laughs> coincidentally, married to Pastor Edward's daughter, so he's bringing you greetings this morning from the church in Damascus. And uh, our church supports Pastor Edward. He's been a speaker here several times. And I've been in contact with Pastor Edward. The church in Damascus, in spite of all the turmoil, all the war, all the people who have been dislocated, is continuing to thrive and grow. So this morning, Jonathan is bringing you greetings from the church in Syria. And he'll be reading out of Luke 2, 8 through 20. Correct. We may be the only church in America looking at Luke 2 this morning. I'm not sure. All right. All right. Good morning and Merry Christmas. Luke 2, uh, 8 through 20. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Thanks, Thanks John. <laughs> Let's uh, pray. Lord, we want to give you thanksgiving this morning for the gift of your son, Jesus. We thank you for the gift of salvation and reconciliation that he brought. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, again speak to us this morning as we look at your scriptures and talk about how they apply to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So perhaps, in my opinion, the best compliment that you can give any speaker is to remember what they said. So when Pastor Craig asked me to speak this morning, a number of weeks ago, I started thinking about one of the best Christmas messages I ever heard, and it was 23 years ago in Mill Creek Elementary, given by our founding pastor, Pastor Dave. So I called Dave and I said, hey Dave, by any chance do you have the outline for that message you gave in Mill Creek Elementary 23 years ago? And Dave said, yeah, I think I can find that. And he said, in fact, I might even have the notes. So this morning, I have with me one of the best Christmas messages I've ever heard from Pastor Dave 23 years ago. And as I read the notes and, and looked at the outline and started to prepare for the message, it brought tears to my eyes on several occasions. And I started to prepare it, but I got writer's block, if you've ever had that. And I couldn't, I couldn't go anywhere. So finally... In the words of that great hymnist, Toby Keith, I decided to talk about me this morning <laughs> and uh, tell you some stories about various Christmas gifts that I had given and received. And, um, you know, some people say Christmas has become too commercialized with all the giving. I sort of agree with that in a way. But I also think Christmas is all about giving and receiving gifts. And um, I probably like to give gifts even more than receive them. When I was a young boy, I can remember being so excited about the gifts I'd have for my parents or somebody else, and I'd want to give them hints. I'd want them to open the present early. I was just burning with excitement to give that gift. Maybe some of you are that way. You get so excited about the gift. Well, in my opinion, God is not so different. I think God was so excited about the gift of Jesus. Excuse me, I think he was dropping hints about this gift for 4,000 years. First hint he dropped was in Genesis 3.15, first book of the Bible. The last hint he dropped in the Old Testament was Malachi 4.6, 
the last book of the Old Testament. And theologians tell us that God dropped 353 hints in the Old Testament about this gift. He was so excited because he knew that it was going to bring hope for the hopeless. That's what God was so excited about. But for the last 400 years before the birth of Christ, there was silence. The Jewish people were in a hopeless situation. For 400 years, they hadn't had any word from the Lord in the written form. Secondly, they were occupied by the Romans, a very oppressive, brutal government. And they were a nation divided. There was four different political parties in Israel. None of them got along. There was the uh, liberals, which were the Sadducees, the conservatives, who were the Pharisees. There was kind of the green party, which was the Essens or the ascetics. Then there was the far right guys, which were known as the zealots, kind of like America when you think about it, a nation divided. And then to top it all off, the Romans made them do this census and put all this government heavy regulation on them for no benefit to them. So as I thought about it, have this hopeless situation and God gives the birth of Jesus to bring hope to the hopeless. Now, studies tell us that three out of four of you will lie if you get a gift and you don't like it. So somebody gives you a gift and you, you get it and you don't like it, you're going to lie and tell them you do. And the number goes higher as you get older. So apparently we become better liars as we get older. Now, many years ago at Christmas time, I asked for a CD, a Christian, Christian CD from a Christian um, music artist, female as it turns out. And in our family, kind of a tradition, maybe because I started it, uh, all my gifts get piled up in front of me. Everybody else has to open their gifts. And I'm the last one to, go to get to open gifts. So I like to um, be the center of attention, open my gifts, right? And I get one gift, looks suspiciously like a CD. I think, wow, this is just what I asked for. This is just what I wanted. I open the gift. It's from my loving wife. My children are all arrayed around me. Beautiful scene of Christmas. I look at the CD. It's not the one I wanted. I took the CD and I threw it across the room. True story. Not necessarily my proudest moment. Turned it into a frisbee. Apparently, I'm not one of the 75% that lies about the gifts I get. And, you know, it was a very ungrateful thing for me to do. And I've also known the pain of giving a val very valuable gifts or thoughtful gifts and have people not appreciate them. And um, I was thinking about that this week when I was driving somewhere to the mall. I was thinking about how people are ungrateful and how it makes it a bummer for you when you give gifts. But I was thinking about how God must feel when we're ungrateful for the gifts he's given us. And all the times that I've been ungrateful to God for all the things he's done for me. So someone has said, Shakespeare, I believe, that ingratitude is sharper than a serpent's tooth. Someone else has said that gratitude is the shortest lived human emotion. So here's the Jewish people, right? 353 hints about the Messiah, the thing they've been waiting for, for 4,000 years that God had planned from eternity. And Jesus shows up and most of them rejected it, just like throwing that CD across the room. No interest in Jesus. You see, he wasn't what they expected. They wanted something different. They wanted a Buckingham Palace Jesus. They wanted a political king, someone who's going to throw the Romans out. Instead, they got a little baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. You know what that means? Rags. Joseph and Mary didn't even have enough money for a onesie. They wrapped the baby in rags. Maybe you remember the slogan from the recent campaign, Make America Great Again. What the Jewish people wanted was someone to make Israel great again. And when Jesus showed up, he wasn't what they wanted. Most of them rejected Jesus. The political leaders did, the Romans did, the wealthy did. Most rejected, but not all. The shepherds accepted him, as we saw this morning. And so did discerning wise men who were interested in truth. And, you know, I never listened to that CD. I was so stubborn, I would never try it to see if it was any good because I wasn't what I wanted or thought I wanted. 
And um, I'm wondering how many people this morning have rejected Jesus, have never given him a chance because it wasn't what you expected or maybe what you wanted. You were looking for Jesus that was going to make your life on earth easy or wealthy or whatever the thought might be. And I'm saying God spent an eternity planning to give us Jesus as the only one who could bridge the gap between God and man. See, there's a story told of a leper colony that didn't know the Lord, and a missionary decided to go there. We knew there was a high probability that he would become a leper if he went there, but he felt that was the only way to bridge the gap. Eventually, he, he caught leprosy. He became just like them, and the gospel spread. That's what God did when he sent Jesus to us as man to bridge that gap. So my question this morning, have you accepted the incredible gift of Jesus this morning, even if it wasn't what you expected? You see, it says in the Bible that John read this morning, the angels rejoiced when Jesus appeared. It teaches us in the Bible that every time one of you accept Christ today, the angels rejoice. It's such a big deal to God to give you that gift that every time someone accepts Christ, there's a celebration in heaven. That's how excited God was about this gift, Jesus. He was so excited, he couldn't wait. And yet, most of us, not all of us, fortunately, praise God, rejected that. So, you can be like me, have stubborn pride, and reject a gift, or you can try it. And we pray that anyone here today who hasn't accepted the Lord will give that a try. Now, another story, I've been married for 36 years. I courted my wife, Sally, and during the dating phase, maybe it was we were even engaged, I adored her. I was crazy about her. I took a big grain sack, not just a 100-pounder, 150-pounder, and I filled it with gifts, bigger than any sack you've ever seen on Santa's back. And they were carefully selected, well-thought-out gifts. I don't know, they all had meaning. The whole thing was full of presents, all individually wrapped by me, not wrapped so great, but wrapped. It was very special. And I set time aside and I made it a priority. So that's how we were during our courtship. Now what do you think I got Sally for Christmas two years ago, after we've been married for 34 years? I got her a snowblower, okay? <laughs> now you may think that's not a thoughtful gift, but you need to consider that I don't want her to hurt her back shoveling snow. <laughs> Furthermore, if she gets a sore back, she can't do the chores and just makes more work for me on the farm. <laughs> so, if you think about that, some of you more cynical might think that gift was more about me than it was for her. And I want to ask you this morning on Christmas, has Christmas become more about you than about Christ? Have you lost that adoration through the busyness, distracted by the parties, the running to and fro? Have you taken the time just to spend the time to remember how amazed you were, what the wonder, like the shepherds had, wondered and amazed at this incredible gift of Jesus. Have you taken that time, even if you've been walking with the Lord for 36 years or 10 years, have you taken that time and made Christmas about the Christ child, not just about everything else that we put with it? Have you made it about adoring him? Now, if I was Pastor Craig, I would break out in, oh, come, let us adore him right now, but I'm not Pastor Craig, and I can't sing, and that would not be a highlight of this message for you if I did that. But my challenge to you this morning is sometime during this Christmas season that you spend some time in wonder and amazement and worship of just what Jesus has meant to you. And in the year ahead, a big theme for Pastor Craig this last month has been being intentional about our walk with the Lord. I think we need to be intentional about setting time aside to spend time with the Lord throughout the day, throughout the week, whether that's devotions, prayer, whatever it is, my challenge to you this morning is to be intentional about spending time in God's Word, intentional about spending time with the Lord, and not let life crowd out the most important thing. Just like so much of Christmas sometimes can crowd out the most important thing. And the last story is about accepting gifts. Um, I come from a large family of nine children, 
And we got to be so big that we used to draw names. This is many years ago when I was younger. And my brother got my name. You only get one gift, so it's kind of a big deal. And uh, he gave me a shirt, okay? Now, I would have much preferred at that stage in my life a knife, a flashlight, remote control car, anything fun. But a shirt was not what I would have wanted. But the worst part was, he got me a shirt that was two sizes too small. <laughs> now, the guy's known me my whole life, right? Clueless to buy me a shirt two sizes too small. Furthermore, I'm borderline claustrophobic and I hate tight clothes, hate them. So, as you've already learned, I'm not always a gracious receiver. I was angry, annoyed, and bitter. I felt like my brother was clueless, should know me better. So, that's how I felt about it. I was not very happy about that situation. Some of you may have got something in your life this year, may feel like you're in a shirt two sizes too small today, some kind of adversary that you weren't expecting. You were looking for something else and you got some adversary. Maybe it's a health issue. Maybe you got a terrible boss. Maybe you know, relationship, marriage issues. Maybe something with your children. Maybe depression, something. I don't know. But maybe something in your life feels like it's two sizes too small and you're uncomfortable this morning. Now, adversity can affect you one of two ways. It can drive you away from God, like it did me and my brother. You can, under, you can get bitter and unforgiveness and quit on God. You can't believe that God would allow that fill-in-the-blank thing in your life. Who loves God, who loves you so much, would allow something like that to come in your life. Or adversity can push you towards God, and you can press into him, and you can stay faithful. Story in Genesis 37, 38, right in there about Joseph, who for 13 years was in slavery in prison for something he did not do, it's a story about a man who stayed faithful to God and during adversity just kept pushing in and pushing in to God. And Joseph said in Genesis 50, 20, what you meant for evil, God used for good. You see, for after 13 years of adversity in prison, God lifted him up and he made him the second most powerful person in the world. Now, if anyone had a right to quit on God, it was probably Joseph because he'd been given these wonderful promises and then he was unjustly thrown in prison in slavery and unjustly accused. But Joseph became a blessing to many countries because he stayed faithful. Now this morning, I'd like to tell you that I gave that shirt to Sally, became her favorite pajamas, she wore it for years, and turned out to be a blessing for our family. I'd like to tell you that, but it's not true. I have no idea what happened to that shirt. I thought it would make a better illustration if I said that, though. So. Leave that aside. Baby Jesus, 400 years of silence. 400 years, the children of Israel are waiting for this promise. Nothing happens. He brought hope to the hopeless at just the right time. Maybe today, your situation is hopeless. You got a choice. You can turn away from God, or you can turn to God. I told you earlier, there's 353 promises about Jesus coming in the Old Testament. But you know how many promises theologians say are in the Bible? 7,000, more than 7,000 promises in the Bible that you can claim and that you can make your own and that you can use to hang on and press into God during times of adversity, during times in your life where things aren't fair, you didn't get what you expected, things aren't going the way you wanted them to, you can use those, any one of those 7,000 promises are there for you to take advantage of. Now, I want to tell you one last story. About five years ago, I had a really big business opportunity. It was the best looking business deal I'd ever seen. I poured all my resources into it. We're talking a huge deal. We're talking private jet big, private island big, and for those of you here in my church family that thinks becoming stinking, filthy, wealthy would have changed me, I want to tell you, you wouldn't have noticed any difference in me except for my jet-powered helicopter would have been parked right out those windows every Sunday morning. Just kidding. Okay, so here's what happened with that deal. We gave it a special secret code name called Yellow Duck. And it was such a big deal. We worked on it for so long 
that we got pictures of yellow ducks. Every Monday morning when I came in the office, somebody put a yellow duck on my desk. I had yellow duck policemen, yellow duck nurses, yellow duck doctors. I had yellow duck calendar made special for me. I had ducks everywhere. In fact, I even got a tie with ducks on it. And I even put the ringtone on my phone as a duck quack. That became my ringtone. There was only one problem with this greatest deal ever. It was a total failure. Even though the, all the experts said it was great, it was the biggest financial failure of my life. And worse, it started me on a drought, a financial drought that lasted for more than four years. We drilled 21 dry holes in a row. Our company did, failed deals. And on top of that, about 18 months, 24 months ago, price of oil and gas, which is what we sell, collapsed. It was a really bad financial drought. It was a bad, scary time. But just like Elijah in the book of Kings, God kept sending me unexpected blessings through what I called ravens and unexpected provisions, and he gave us a pot of provision that didn't run out. So all through that drought, all through that terrible time, God kept sending provision. Now, it appears that the drought is lifting now, but the biggest change in me that occurred during the last four years is I've become more grateful to God. Most of my prayer time is now spent in Thanksgiving, whereas I used to be praying once in a while for you guys, but most of the time for myself. That was another joke, sorry. Um, now, I spend most of my time in Thanksgiving re realizing all the blessings the Lord's brought into my life. Anyway, to get back to the story, my ringtone on my phone is still that duck quack. And every once in a while, I'll be in a business meeting or somewhere with someone who's invested in yellow duck, and they hear that duck phone go off, and they'll really get mad at me. Get that ring off your phone. Change it to anything. Dog, we don't care. Dog, cow, we don't care. Get that, do get that duck off your phone. And they really get mad because it reminds them of a big, painful failure in their life. So two weeks ago this morning, I was sitting in the church parking lot right across the way, and I was thinking, should I take that ringtone off my phone? And I started thinking, you know, I'm not going to take it off because even though that duck used to be a symbol of my biggest failure, it's now become a symbol of God's faithfulness to me and his provision during one of the worst times in my life. So it's become a symbol of God's faithfulness. Who else but God could provide so abundantly during a, during a four-year drought. So today, whatever adversity you're facing, whatever problem you have in your life, God can take your defeat and turn it into victory. You see, earlier, Jesus was rejected by the religious rulers and by the Romans, and eventually, he went to die on a cross. And if you look above me, right there, I love that cross. Got God reaching down, us reaching up. And that cross, which was a symbol of defeat, is now the symbol of victory for every one of us who puts our trust in Jesus. God can take that thing that's a defeat in your life, that shirt that's two sizes too small, whatever thing that you can't stand, that you're uncomfortable about this morning, God can take that thing and turn it from defeat into victory, just like he's done with the cross just like he's done in so many people's life, God is reaching up down to you this morning. Are you willing to reach up and press into him? We're going to have some music as we close. We're going to sing, Oh, How I Adore Him. And I want to just share in closing that God has promised never to leave you or forsake you. That's just one of the 7,000 promises that are in the Bible that you can take advantage of today. You want to have your best Christmas presents ever? Go take five promises out of God's Word this afternoon or tomorrow and claim them, write them down, and live by them and pray them back to God. He's faithful. He keeps his word. He keeps his promises. Even after 400 years of silence, God kept his word. After 4,000 years of the first hint of Jesus, he kept his word. He'll keep his word in your life. You keep pressing into him. So today, have you accepted the gift of Jesus? Have you rejected? It's always a choice. Jesus is the only way to bridge that gap between us and God. Today, have you been intentional about your relationship with Jesus? Are you worshiping him and making him the center point? 
And finally, whatever that thing is in your life, whatever you want to call adversity, is it pushing you towards God or is it pushing you away from God? And if it's pushing you away from God, you need to turn around, move back towards God, claim some of those 7,000 promises and make that a key part of this new year and key part of this Christmas. We're going to sing Come Let's Adore Him and then Rick is going to close for us. God bless.